In the proxy fight of the Walt Disney Company going on right now, leading up to the annual shareholder meeting on Wednesday, April 3rd, we'll be covering that live right here on Valiant Renegade. You know the two key players. Number one, CEO Bob Iger of the Walt Disney Company, who's been there in that position for nearly 20 years, short of an 11-month interruption, as he put it recently, to Morgan Stanley. And then, of course, there's Nelson Peltz, the 80-year-old activist investor who doesn't like to be referred to as an activist at Tryan Management. And for the last several months, those two gentlemen have been going at it with shareholders trying to garner as much support as possible. Some even suggesting now that Bob Iger's desperation in trying to garner endorsements for his side may be showing a bit of desperation for the Walt Disney Company and Bob Iger's puppet board. But there are other players on the field that people need to consider. Last week, Glass Lewis backed the Walt Disney Company and Bob Iger, the second largest proxy advisory firm out there for institutional shareholders like mutual fund companies and big banks. But then a couple of days later, we got the big dog jump into the fight. And that was ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services, that backed Nelson Peltz. That is going to swing a lot of attention Nelson's way and might just be enough to turn the tide to get him a board seat. The following is a clip from the Valiant Renegade online live show this past Sunday where we discussed this in greater detail. Sit back, relax. Here we go. So earlier this week, uh, Disney received the backing from a proxy advisory firm uh, called Glass Lewis. There's basically two big ones out there, okay? There's Glass Lewis and there's uh, Institutional Shareholder Services, or ISS. And people often will look at this kind of thing. They'll glance right past it. They don't, I mean, it it shouldn't register to most people out there because this this is fairly inside baseball kind of stuff. Um. But what this means is that I'll read from the article here. Walt Disney Monday received a critical endorsement from a proxy advisory firm when Glass Lewis urged shareholders to reelect all of the company's directors in one of the season's most hotly contested boardroom battles. The recommendation which can sway how investors vote in critical elections dealt a blow to try and fund management and Blackwell's capital as the two head fund argues Disney needs new blood in the boardroom to reinvigorate the giant. Glass Lewis says the company's most recent financial quarter serves as a promising indication, blah, 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 blah. So basically what this means is the, the, the shares that they advise, and they advise mutual fund companies. They advise institutional investors. In many cases, firms like this, um, and, and, and when I say advise, they advise the mutual fund companies and the institutionals how to vote on these kind of things. They do the research, they do the due diligence, and they say, you should vote your shares this way. In some cases, these firms actually have the proxying voting power of the institutionals themselves and vote on behalf of them. So, you know, in this regard, this was bad news for Nelson uh, to see. But as Pro mentioned earlier, or uh, some of it was brought up earlier, do, what kind of impact would this have? Or a super chat asked this. And the thing is, is my opinion, Voting for the Disney board as it is, is kind of the default option. I don't know if something like this truly moves a needle uh, away from Pelts any further than it already was. This was kind of kind of be what was going to happen anyway. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but and I think they don't have the numbers in this one. Yeah. Gaining traction. Glass Lewis. It doesn't really say, but all right. <clears throat> Glass. Lu- okay. It is down here. And this was what was funny. Okay. Disney's board, 12 members, try on put forward two candidates. The tussle over who will serve on Disney's board has the most been, been one of the most bitter and expensive uh, of the season with try saying the company Disney has lost its creative engine. Disney has received powerful endorsements from another hedge fund, Value Act. We've talked about them. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, which is a no surprise, uh, whose bank is defending the company against the hedge funds. Jamie Dimon, of course, also sits next to Melody Hobson, who is George Lucas's wife on the board of directors of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank? I guarantee you, this is how the the Lucas uh, endorsement came to be. 
This and was, I agree with you and kudos for, for that. That was a great observation. So yeah, I gave you credit in our <laughs> most recent video on it. I, I also would not be shocked if uh, Jamie Dimon might have, don't know this folks, but if he might have gotten wind of uh, what ISS was going to do and thus the timing. It very well could have been because, and this is the point, uh, Disney received those endorsements, Glass Lewis and Institutional Shareholder Services, its bigger rival, <clears throat> often help investors decide how to vote in critical corporate ele elections. ISS has not yet issued its report. Well, dag nabbit, they sure did two days later. And ISS, the bigger of the two, and this is this is the one that I think matters more for two reasons. Glass Lewis, I think, has about a 40 to 42 percent market share in this particular type of business in terms of proxy advisory services. ISS has the other part. <laughs> ISS has like 55 percent of the market. They are the bigger of the two. Um, so that's number one. That's good news. And they have urged shareholders to vote for Nelson Peltz. They did not urge for the vote of Jay Rasulo. Now, I don't think that's because necessarily that they don't like Jay Rasulo. I think it's because they didn't want to back Peltz's play on which of the other board members that he wanted to boot in favor of Rasulo, which was Mr. Michael Froman. So we can have that discussion. But ISS has now jumped in behind Peltz. I think this has more impact than what Glass Lewis did, because, again, like I said, I think the default position for most investors who actually pay attention would be, Vote what Bob says. Vote would vote the Disney slate, just as it would be. Vote the IBM slate. Vote the Walmart slate. Vote this slate. You usually go with the default because there's never any proxy fight over it. That's the default position. I think with this, this pushes the needle much more in Peltz's favor. It's still not a guarantee that he gets on the board, but this, I think, this does push things way more in his direction than I would have assumed could possibly be a week ago. So, Andre, what do you, what do you think about all this? Well, you, here you have uh, similar companies offering uh, very different uh, different um, uh, recommendations, which is uh, which is interesting all of its own, mm -hmm. and uh, that tells me that uh, one of them may be uh, may be a little bit closer to you know the likes of J.P. Morgan Chase, and maybe there's some connections there that we don't necessarily know about or maybe not supposed to think that but there is one thing that uh, strikes me uh, with uh, with uh, this glass company that recommends voting for the current board and glass there Lewis, yeah. there exactly uh, i'm obviously not too familiar with these companies this is your forte like i know my fan and finance in general but i know the norwegian side of things i know the generalities don't know too much about like these american specifics but if this was in norway what I can say is that what these companies would have looked at before anything else, before any performance or anything like that, and this is why I keep harping on about this, does this board do what a board is actually supposed to do? And unless the, uh, the asked body is completely and totally corrupt, the first thing they would say in the case of Disney's board is that the board is supposed to keep the CEO accountable to the shareholders. That is the most fundamental thing. How it performed in the last quarter, last fiscal year, that is completely incidental. Thus the board does what the board is fundamentally supposed to do. Does it have the composition that allows it to function as a board? In the case of Disney, the answer to that is no. I've said it many times over. Disney functionally doesn't have a board. It has a board in paper or, or on paper. It has a board in name, but it's in name only. Because functionally, what Disney's board right now is rather than protect, sorry, rather than, than hold IQ accountable to the shareholders, this board shields and protects Iger from the shareholders yep. while enabling anything that he wants to do. So if this was in Norway, our bodies, again, unless they were completely corrupt, 
would have advised, you need to change this right now because this board is dysfunctional and this CEO has dictatorial power that no CEO is supposed to have. And we don't care what happened in the last fiscal year because this is something so fundamental that isn't working. And that's my issue here. I don't think that Disney should ever have gotten to the position where it is right now if it had a functional board. And then Correct. any company, anyone that tells me or that says that you, you should vote for the current board as it is right now. I'll say this because I have no ties to the financial industry. I, you can't say this, so I'll say it. They are completely and utterly bought and corrupt. And their recommendations must be disregarded because the fact that they, anyone, will recommend this board that isn't even a board because it cannot possibly function as a board with these close ties to Bob Iger, they're corrupt and they need to be investigated for corruption. I, I think most of this board is, much. it's mostly just apathy. They're collecting a, a very healthy stipend for being a board member each and every year. Uh, Absolutely. But, but they're not functioning as board members and they're not holding the CEO accountable. They're not in a position where they can do it. They have not been appointed by the shareholders. They've been appointed by the CEO. The CEO has appointed the board rather than the shareholders. More or in less. In the rest of the yeah. world, we call that corruption. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may not less. do it in America, but in Norway, that would be called corruption. And so it would in Sweden, Denmark, Germany. We don't do that stuff. And if we do, and it's in such small companies that no one cares because it's just like a tax shelter anyway. But when you have this kind of a, it's corruption, pure corruption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things with this, and I, I see a lot of people kind of gravitating around, if there's one thing that everybody agrees on unequivocally, whether regardless of which side of the fight they're on with this, everybody seems to agree that the board failed when it came to succession planning over and over and over and over again. Forget everything else Peltz has talked about. That's, that's the one thing. Even Alex Sherman made a crack about that today, I think on X or yesterday talking about that after this ISS thing. And I think that, that seems like the thing that the one thing that everybody can can agree on. And, and the reason for that is simple. It's because Bob Iger hasn't wanted to leave. And to your point, Andre, you're correct. He basically controls that board because otherwise he would not be there still. Yeah. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And for people to understand securing the support, this is from the CNBC article <clears throat> of ISS and Glass Lewis are crucial in activist fights. Large institutional shareholders will often, but not always, vote based on the recommendation of either of the two proxy firms. Activists and management each make their case to the advisory firms, which in turn issue their opinions based on meetings with either side in their own analysis. Um, in some cases, these firms are, I, I think they actually, some of them actually do the voting if the other institutional investor has given them authorization to handle that. Sometimes it's just in an advisory capacity, but I've, I've heard stories both ways. But the issue is, is that to have one of these, to have the biggest firm, the biggest uh, advisory firm in this regard actually say, nope, we want you guys to go ahead and vote for Nelson Peltz and withhold your vote from Mary Laguizimo, which is what Peltz has asked people to do. He's also asked to withhold the vote for uh, Michael Froman uh, and instead vote for Jay Rusulo, but they say in here, and I find this interesting to the point, um, talking about here, here, let's see where we go. Uh, while siding with Peltz, ISS told shareholders not to back Jay Rusulo in the fight, citing his previous positioning as a potential successor to Iger. Quote, though we at ISS do not have any concerns about his ability to serve as an objective director. We recognize that Rasulo's potential presence might create added friction on the board. It's a very interesting statement. I get where ISS is going here, and I think they're trying to find a happy middle ground, right? Um, they really want to get pelts on this board because they 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 are they're they very clearly know Disney needs something. They need something to completely rattle their cage. Um, but I think they found a happy middle ground, saying, "Hey, look, look." We don't want, you know, we don't want Bob 
to get distracted with Jay Rasulo. Um, so we'll we'll let y'all have that seat, but we do need pelts on here. I think this is where it, I, and I think it's kind of a smart play with ISS because it's going to push a lot more of the ratio of votes if they're successful into Peltz's corner, potentially, um, which which is what you need. As long as he gets on there, as long as somebody outside of Iger Circle gets on there, it could be a potential huge help. So <clears throat> Indeed. Uh, really, all you need is one person who does not comply, because the problem as it is right now is every mm -hmm. single person, this is what's so unbelievable, if a CEO appoints a couple of people on the board, that's no problem as long as the shareholders have appointed the rest. But as it is right now, you have um, a situation where the shareholders have appointed none and the CEO have appointed all. They're all loyal to him, which means that as it is right now, he can do literally anything he wants and the uh, the shareholder, sorry, the board will protect him, basically sign off on everything that he wants to do with no debate or something like that. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can have debate. You can have uh, Iger say, I suggest that we go this way. Mm -hmm. Anyone disagree and you're out of the board and you don't get this cushy job anymore? No? Okay, cool. Let's do that way. That's kind of like how it works right now. But as long, if you have one person and that person really knows what they want, that's going to disrupt that whole thing. And that, of course, is why you have the likes of uh, of BlackRock and of JP Morgan Chase, who are so unbelievably against uh, Pelts coming on the board, because the moment he does, they can no longer have Iger do their bidding at his whim. And that is over, because he's suddenly going to protect the shareholder interest. Why else would they be so against it when the board is comprised of so many useless dolts? I mean, they're all successful in their own business, but but all these accusations that uh, Team Pelts is so amateur when it comes to entertainment is completely ridiculous. When you look at some of those um, board members that we have right now. Yeah, you're right. And you, you said the key word there, amateur, right? That's that's a word. Uh, Disney has been making fun of Pelts's restore the magic, right? That, that, that whole phrase that he's using uh, in this proxy fight. Uh, if I go to here, restore the magic, right? Disney likes to make fun at this. Magic isn't for amateurs in all kind of corporate pablum and, and propaganda, which is why this story bothered me so much. Yeah. You know because who else it's not for? Commies. But uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but this is why I said, you know, I think you're right. I think Iger knew potentially that this was going to come from ISS. And we've seen Iger running around stumping very hard to get big name people, influential people to come publicly endorse him. Uh, and you have this statement from George Lucas, which uh, people out there can agree or disagree with me on this one. This was not written by George. And I have my doubts as to whether George even may really know before this went out again. It's not conspiracy theories, folks, just 20 years in the financial industry. You know, when you get to be 80 years old and you've basically turned over the management of your financial and business affairs to your wife. Who manages 15 billion dollars of assets under management at a mutual fund company called Ariel, which she co-CEOs and has for many, many, many years. I think, in fact, about maybe 30 years at this point, 20 years. Um. This is an intelligent woman that would know how to do this. And if you were in George's position, you might turn things over to your wife who can issue statements in your name. Um, I don't think George cares enough to come out and make a public endorsement. And I don't think he's the type that would. That's where I'm at. No, this may I, be I some. Yeah, this may be something he was fully cognizant of and he was fully behind. He didn't write it clearly, um, but he let's say he signed off on it. But this notion that he had to have signed off on it. Sorry, folks. It's actually not factually correct. Yeah. Not nope. if certain things were in place like powers of attorney or you turn things over to spouses as a business manager in this case, which my understanding is Melanie has a lot of control over the uh, Lucas's estate at this point. Absolutely. So. And I also, um, I don't think it's 
unlikely that like she's on the on the uh, board of directors of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Yep. Uh, and I'm and she's obviously very skilled. She's gone very far in business and stuff like that. I'm not suggesting anything else, but I do believe that she being the wife and possibly the legal guardian with the, with the power of attorney over the single largest individual shareholder in Disney, who is therefore very valuable to J.P. Morgan Chase, may have had something to do with her ending up on that board in the first place. Just maybe, maybe that had maybe. something to do with her being on that board as opposed to a thousand other people that would otherwise be equally qualified. Yeah. I mean, if anybody, if, if, if people at least need to agree with, with me on this one, I would hope that this conversation did not start with Bob Iger calling George Lucas. No, no, this it, conversation. I don't think so either. No, this conversation started with Bob Iger and Jamie Dimon sitting down and, and having a talk with Melody Hobson, who was probably more than happy to back Bob up. It's not like I don't she had even to have know that Tiger was there in that talk. I think it was Maybe probably the, the, the two of them. It's and, probably just um, Jamie. Uh, exactly. And Iger says, you take care of it. She's your employee. You could go fix this for me. And yeah, that, that's it's it. probably Disney. You know, it's probably Disney that wrote the thing. And then, you know, oh, George, Disney obviously wrote that. A representative for George slapped, you know, the seal of approval on it. And Disney schedule it and then there you go. Creating magic is not for amateurs. That's right out of Disney's uh, propaganda. Uh, yep. And then when you've got other things like this, talking about Bob Iger's leadership, iconic brand, uh, that's been coming out of Disney language a lot lately because Peltz has been talking about Disney as an iconic brand. Um, I have full faith and confidence in the power of Disney, Bob's track record of driving long-term value. Again, we're, Bob Iger driving long-term value right out of Disney language in the propaganda pieces, um, so on and so forth. So, And the again, play this week is going to be that Peltz is an istophobe. What, yeah. Just watch. That's going to be the thing that comes out this week from not necessarily straight from Disney, but from their, their uh, sycophants and those in their circle. Yeah, and, and the thing I want to say uh, is this, is that, like I said, what's bugged me the most is how George looked last year walking out on stage at Indiana Jones. Well, in his in his defense, if he had already seen the movie, it's hard to well, it's hard to work out, you know, with a uh, yeah. nice gander after that one. Man's eighty but, years old. He's not in the best of health. It's obviously been wearing on him. He's not a public guy to do stuff like this and endorse like this. This this whole thing bothers me. It will continue to bother me. George may come out and tomorrow say, "Oh no, I totally wrote this," or "I just Disney wrote it and I signed off on it. I'm great with it. I love Bob and." I, I'll be like, dude, I was wrong, but something is going to bother me about this from now until the end of days, because we'll never really know. Um, it just, it's going to bug me again, because I've seen this professionally many times in my career. I have to take continuing education classes every single year on things like elder abuse, where, you know, you, you use a power of attorney in a way that maybe wasn't intended or, you know, people that have power over assets and things like this do things sometimes that maybe they shouldn't or maybe without the full knowledge of the person they're managing. And I'm not saying that that is specifically what happened here. I'm just saying there's plenty of ways this could have happened without George Lucas going, here's my signature. Good to go. Make sure you're subscribed to Valiant Renegade and join us every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show.